One, it's Major League Baseball opening day. The opening weekend of the 2024 season. Could you name the top 10 most famous players in Major League Baseball by jersey sales? Two, Texas is now in the SEC. Can we figure out who's who in the SEC? If you were in a frat, who's Texas? Who's Georgia? Who's LSU? And three, what's happening with that? Something's happening. What's happening in Dallas? It's the Will Kane Show on foxnews.com, on the Fox News YouTube channel, on the Fox News Facebook page, streaming live Monday through Thursday, 12 o'clock Eastern time, and always on demand at Apple, Spotify, or on YouTube. Just hit subscribe. Today is a sports exclusive, Kane on Sports edition of the Will Kane Show. Yesterday, I got to go to Globe Life Field for opening day for the Texas Rangers, the World Series champion Texas Rangers. And I'm more into baseball than I've been in the better part of a decade. Earlier this week on the Will Kane Show, we had A.J. Prasinski, the former World Series champion, all-star catcher, and Fox Sports baseball analyst on the Will Kane Show to talk about, hey, is baseball healthy or is baseball sick? And AJ and I walked through some various issues in baseball to see if its arrow is pointed up or arrow is pointed down. AJ brought up the lack of national stars. He said that baseball is a regional sport, and that certainly is the case for me. I can name for you the top not just the entirety of the Rangers starting pitching rotation, but their, but their lineup. And I can even name, I don't know if I could do the top 10. I could probably do the top 10 prospects in the Texas Rangers minor league farm system from pitchers like Owen White and Jack Leiter to Kumar Rocker and Brock Porter to field players like Justin Foscue and the guys will be in rookie of the year race this year, Evan Carter and Wyatt Langford. I can do that deep for my team, for the Texas Rangers. But I don't know that I could name the 10 biggest players in baseball, the biggest stars by jersey sales. So could you? Let's start today with a little MLB quiz, with story number one. Can we name the biggest stars in baseball? Baseball is notorious that Mike Trout's been the biggest star for the last decade and we used to play a game on the Will Kane show on ESPN of call up your buddy and ask him who Mac Trout was. Sports fans, friends, and very few could pass who is Mike Trout. Um, but could I do it today? Could I name the biggest stars by jersey sales in Major League Baseball, despite how in I am on the Texas Rangers? And what that reveals about it being a regional sport, what do even I know about it as a national sport? So we'll bring in the crew two a days. Dan Young, Establishment, James, and Tinfoil Pat. They're going to run me through a quiz, see if I can get the top 10 jersey sales in Major League Baseball. Ready, fellas? Ready to do it. Um, All right. So you name a player who you think is in the top 10 right now. I have the list in front of me. This is from 2023, the most popular jerseys being sold. So what do you think would would go in that list? All right. Number one I can get, it's got to be Shohei Otani is in the top 10. That's number one. He's in the top. He obviously the Angels at that point. So, yeah, he's number one on that list. Okay. It'd be like Family Feud Mm -hmm. where you just kind of guess and, Uh, you know. Yeah. 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 We'll come in. Survey says comes in at number four. But I actually think I have the top two down pretty easily. I think Otani was one, and I think Aaron Judge is number two. New York Yankees, Aaron Judge. That's incorrect. He's actually on that list pretty close, but he's not number two. Do you want me to give you where he is actually on the list? Yes. He's number yes. three on that list, Aaron Judge. Very high, which I thought, but he's number three and not number two. Okay, but I'm, I'm, I'm so far doing pretty well. <laughs> two guesses in yeah. the top ten. But this is where it actually peters out for me. <laughs> this is where it gets more difficult. Okay. I am going to say Jose Altuve is in the top ten. That's correct. Jose Altuve is. He is a little higher up. He is number six i'm kind of surprised in that one because he's a pretty controversial guy being on the astros um but he's number six on that list astros are really popular big fan base big fan base in houston and so such that i'm tempted to also offer up alex bregman yeah and i think 
he could be in the top 10. If not, he's going to be narrowly missing. But since I'm going to be struggling for even names, I am going to say Bregman is also in the top 10. He is. He's down at number nine, but he's still making the top 10. He's a likable player. I get that one. All right. I'm four for four so far. We're, good. We're doing well. I got to think big markets. Um, I got to think Dodgers and Yankees, I think. Or I need to think international stars like Otani. But I got to go Dodgers. Um, I don't know. Bellinger bets. I, I'm going Mookie Betts is top 10. Woo, baby. Yep. Number five, Mookie Betts is on that top list. He's in the top five which I'm not surprised about. He's a great player. Dodgers, L.A., you know. I'm five for five, and I didn't get number two, though, so far. Nope. The second biggest jersey sale in Major League Baseball. This is going to get way, way tougher for me. Um, God, at one time, I would have said Clayton Kershaw as well, but I don't know. He's such on the back end of his career. But how much, like, residual fame continues to drive jersey sales? Um. Who's the Yankees guy outside of Judge that would be the most popular? Uh, I'll say I'm a little surprised at number two. Um, you know, he's he had a historic season. Yeah, he had an historic season. Um, he's a great player. Um, pretty big market. Good team. You're gonna you're gonna kick yourself. I don't know. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I am. Well, I'm not going for him just yet, but. I've got to think that despite the fact that he's like the biggest star that no one knows, he makes the top 10. I have to think Mike Trout's in the top 10. Yep, He is. Mike Trout's number 10 on the list. He's there. I mean, it's just it's tough. He's on a crappy team. but He's probably the oldest player on that list, too. Yep, so he is. He's been around. I'm doing way better than i would have thought, i knew you would honest. see you were down on yourself but i knew you would do this well because it, looking at this list is not surprising at all mm -hmm. except a couple i wouldn't have gotten Bregman, <sighs> so I'm, I'm impressed one of them is a, one of them's a rookie of the year um yeah you would know him well because he's, um, he's in your division oh i was going orioles direction there for a minute um but i don't think the orioles or a rookie would put a jersey in the top 10 in the division, um, I mean, you want to stick with the Astros, Mariners. Uh, do you play? Mariners M got, do you play oh MLB boy. the Show at all? The Never. video game. Okay. Never. He won it. No. He, he did very well in the home run derby. I'm. I almost just for establishment, James. I want to say George Kirby. I nah, know we're talking. We're not going that up. Pitcher, but. Everybody's Close. talking about the Mariners' rotation. Right team, right everybody's team. talking. Everybody's talking about the Mariners' rotation. And they talk about your boy, who you ran oh, into yeah. high school at one time. He shoved you into a locker up in Westchester and <laughs> came together for ten years. Didn't Jordan count. Kirby. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> worked out every day. Doesn't count. <laughs> it's my best friend. Remember when he bullied me at lunch in the lunchroom? Um, uh, Mariners home run hitter. I, I don't know. I, I don't know. Um. Yeah, I, I don't I don't know. So I'm gonna just to venture see if I can get I'm I'm gonna say Kershaw's in the top ten still. He's not. He's not in the top ten. Hmm. Let's see. He's not even Do you think any... the pitchers the pitchers have trouble making these lists? It's, I, not it many does pitchers. Look like maybe. a lot less pitchers even. even I'm looking at the top time. twenty two and there's not a lot of pitchers. I don't know why, but they don't seem to make the top in jersey sales. I don't know why that is. Because you would think Honestly, this, you'd think Verlander this, would be up there as well. Like, or, 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 I would bet you in the early 2000s, it's, late 90s, you have yeah. Clemens, Johnson, Pedro. No doubt. I bet you those guys were cleaning up. You so still see Randy sense. Johnson jerseys around. Yeah, that's true. Yeah, there's I no, would think DeGrom joining a new team there's would, no been, Garrett, would no have been Garrett big. Cole on this list? Oh, Garrett Cole. Yeah, that was that's the Not Yankee there. I should have picked. Okay, so I, I'm I'm running dry in the last four, so let's do a thing. You you give me a name, I'll say you get if they're in or out. Don't give me just true. Give me some falses in there as well to see if I can get him. All right, let's go with uh Freddie Freeman. Do you think they're in or out the top ten? Atlanta Braves was yeah. a Dodger, right? Mm -hmm. Um so a lot of fame there. I'm gonna go Freddie Freeman is in. Nope, he's number 11, just out of the top 10. But he's up mm. there. 
He's a big he's a big time uh one there. All right, we're gonna go with how about uh Fernando Tatis Jr. Oh yeah. I should have thought about oh that's who I was thinking also, you would think of. Oh, I was also Juan Soto's but so uh, 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 yeah. Um Fernando Tatis Jr. No, Juan Soto, yes. No, Fernando Tatis Jr. is number four on the list. Really? Yeah, he's huge. The kids love him. He, why I asked about MLB The Show, he was on the cover of it last year. You know, he's a big player. People okay. love him. Yeah, yeah. And Soto is not in the top 10. Soto's not in the top 10. Juan Soto is not That's the, he was still in the top 20. When did he get? Did he, did he play right. the full last year with the Padres? Yeah, he I don't know. Created, yeah, before Mid-season? the season. Or before, okay. All right, let's go with another player. What what do you think about Francisco Lindor? The Mets. Popular player. Um well, that's New York. Mm-hmm. Is he their marquee player with the Mets? Mm-hmm. Um I'll go yes Alonso on too. Lindor. No, he's number nineteen on the list. Oh, you you're throwing me a lot of curveballs. Throwing here. some curveballs here. Sooner or later it's gotta be a true. <laughs> but, uh... It's gotta be a true. All right, let's go with uh Julio Rodriguez. Uh, Seattle Mariners. Is, is that the the Mariners guy you're talking about? There um, we go. There we go. He's number seven. Yes. On this. this is like filling in. It's like filling in answer bubble on the number SAT. Seven. Sooner or later, C C is right. So I'm going to go. Yes, he's number seven. <laughs> he's number seven on the list. What about uh Bryce Harper? Oh gosh, yes. How did I forget Bryce Harper? Yes, he's top ten. He's not even in the top twenty. Really? Yeah, I'm on MLBShop.com. Like, I'm looking at the the jersey sales. Maybe that. Maybe this is a, how maybe, is. Maybe this list is all messed up because they're trying to sell out inventory. <laughs> probably. Maybe they're, they're messing with us. Maybe. <laughs> how is Bryce Harper not top ten? I don't know. That's he's got it. That was very surprising to me. Um, did you guys ever fill out a test where you just filled out C the whole way? You didn't know. So you're just like, I'm just going to go C and see what grade I get on the nah. multiple choice little. Did you guys even have Scantrons? Or are you yeah. too young? Do you even know what I'm talking about? I yeah. did. I did. The little sure. Scantrons? Yeah, yeah. I was homeschooled. You just find the smartest kid in the class. And you get the it, same yeah. grades. Exactly. <laughs> All right. Give me the rest of the top 10. I'm out. What, who, who did I miss? All right. So number two, you missed Ronald Acuna Jr. from the Atlanta Braves. He was number oh. two on that list. One more brave there. I, I, yeah. Um, then we had, I thought we had a pre-show conversation, and he was brought up, and it, and somebody said he wasn't, so I wasn't going with him. So I so I said that pre-show, said that pre-show conversation, conversation that, yes. and I didn't think he was, but I was wrong completely about that. So that's my bad. Okay. Um, All right. Number eight. So I'm missing number eight. Yep. We have another brave. Matt Olson is on that list. Oh gosh, never, never would have gotten it. Yeah, me either. And then number nine is you know, the other one I didn't get. Or, I, no, we did. Uh, number nine was Bregman. Oh, all right. Not bad. Yeah. Not bad. Yeah. No, a few stars in Major League Baseball. There's your top 10 jersey sales. Um, I don't know if you could get them, but I'm going to give myself a passing grade. I don't even feel bad about the ones that I didn't get, except for maybe Ronald Acuna Jr. But that one, they, that I was given bad information, which ruined my guessing. All right, coming up. Texas in the SEC. Let's talk about who these stereotypes are in the SEC, the various teams in the conference and who they are in your frat. And do we like the new rules in the NFL? Do we like banning the hip drop tap tackle and changing the kickoff? Should we just get rid of kickers? Let's do that next with Outkicks Barrett Sally. Have some fun with the SEC. Which one of these schools are what guy in your fraternity? It is the Will Cain Show streaming live Monday through Thursday, 12 o'clock Eastern time at foxnews.com and the Fox News YouTube channel and Facebook page. The Cain on Sports Edition, like every other episode in full air in part, is available for subscription, um, free subscription. Just hit subscribe. When I say subscription, I want to be clear. You don't pay anything. You just hang out with the Will Cain Show on YouTube or on Apple or on Spotify. He is the host of the Covered and Smothered podcast. He's a new columnist at OutKick, and I'm glad to have him hanging out today on the Will Kane Show. It is Barrett Sally. He's a columnist at OutKick, and you can catch him at the College Football Smothered and Covered podcast. It is Barrett Sally on the Will Kane Show. What's up, Barrett? Oh, man, just cranking through an offseason, trying to uh, 
keep kids out of trouble. You know, driving is an issue a little bit uh, for these kids, driving with expired license and things like that. So hopefully nothing bad happens with some of these kids in uh, the college football world. But uh, happy to be on with you. It's a pleasure to be on your show. Big fan and uh, looking forward to this conversation. You're referencing, I think, Georgia. And people are talking about some of the stuff that's going on with the Bulldogs. Is there a cultural problem at Georgia? I mean, I don't like to extrapolate off of a few situations, and there's always kids that get into trouble. Uh, it's always a question, though, as well. Is it is it some kind of reflection of a, a bigger problem? Is it a cultural problem at Georgia? I don't think it's a cultural problem. I think I call it an incident program, right? They're just incidents that happen over and over again because like some of these are driving with a suspended license or improper use of a moped or things like that. So, you know, there are the more serious ones, obviously the tragic death of a, of an offensive lineman, Devin Will- Willock and, and Chandler LaCroix, a recruiting uh, staffer last year. So those are serious, obviously. Uh, but uh, growing up around um, the state of Georgia, uh, I had a lot of friends that go to Athens. Athens PD, they make their money off traffic stops. Like that is that is big business for them. So, you know, it, it is a Georgia player problem because it keeps happening over and over again. But I think more importantly, it's just what happens in Athens, whether it be big things or small things. A lot of kids get into trouble doing stuff like this. So, no, I don't think it's a cultural problem. Kirby has addressed it. Um, he addressed it actually this week uh, as well. So. You just have to you're gonna kind of move on from these things and try to educate players as much as you possibly can. But, I mean, Will, uh, I know I did. I don't know about you, but I know I made some stupid mistakes when I was in college. I'm still making them, Barrett. I'm still making them. <laughs> I don't even want to talk about which of those violations I might be guilty of as we speak. Um, your knowledge of Georgia, your knowledge of the SEC, I, I, I kind of want to lead into that. So, of course, my school, the Texas Longhorns, new to the SEC next year, and I was thinking about, how Texas fits into the SEC, Barrett. And um, it's interesting. A lot of Texas kids are starting to go to SEC schools. My brother went to Auburn, as you did back in the day. So he's he's a Tiger, War Eagle. But um, a lot of kids choosing Auburn, a lot of kids choosing Georgia. And it got me thinking to like, who is what? Like, who? how do different schools fit into the SEC? And I'll just tell you, like, as Texas comes in, if we were saying – you know, the entire conference is your fraternity. Texas is your frat brother that comes in with a big last name. His daddy's wealthy. He's entitled. Um, and I'm a fan and I'm a longhorn, but I know who I am. I know who we are. That's Texas. And so it's going to rub some people the wrong way in the SEC, I'm sure. Um, give me who like my perception my brother have gone having gone to auburn and then of course relationship with alabama i think of auburn as like the middle child like the forgotten uh brother the maybe the little bit bitter but quiet frat brother who who is uh like give me some some who these guys are who these schools are in the sec well, you mentioned Texas and how they're the, the frat brother that comes in with the big name and everything. And like looking back at my college career, that guy, you know, that kind of frat brother can go in two directions, right? He can become something, something big, you know, CEO, things like that, get his stuff together, use his connections to become uh, someone in power, or they could be spoiled. They could go downhill in a hurry, drop out of college and never be heard from again. And I think Texas is the former. Like, I think, like, a couple years ago, I would have said Texas is not ready for the SEC. Like, when it was announced in 2021, I said Texas is not going to be ready for the SEC because Texas was sort of spinning its wheels and has been spinning its wheels for, for a decade. But when Texas went to Alabama and played better SEC football than Alabama, because that's what it did. You know, they, they won in the trenches. When that happened... Granted, Alabama's offensive line has not been good, but that told me this team's ready. And it's because of Steve Sarkeesian. He understands, you know, how to win in the SEC, how to build a roster, how to build a roster in this day and age, which is completely different than it was five years ago. Um, so, yeah, I think right now Texas is ready uh, to be, I think, Georgia's biggest threat, not only this year, but maybe moving forward uh, because of, of the talent that Sark has access to how he operates both from a financial perspective and from a a transfer portal perspective. And so, yeah, I think Texas is going to be that 
that new kid on the block, that new frat brother that uses his connections and becomes something really great. Um, you mentioned Auburn. Uh, to me, I feel like Auburn, it has detached itself a little from Alabama because when Cam got there in 2010 and they won a national title, I think suddenly folks realized, hey, Auburn can win playing the way Auburn does, being what Auburn is. It's not Alabama's little brother. It's more like a little cousin where, yeah, sometimes they, they do things their way and they're successful and that's awesome. But they're still kind of in that shadow. Um, so, but I think the if we're going to talk more about some of these, LSU is just the drunk frat brother that sometimes has an amazing night. Like that, that's no just doubt. one of those things where sloppy, passed out by eleven o'clock midnight, uh, <laughs> but sometimes pukes and rallies and has himself a great time. Um, so that, that's kind of <laughs> how I look like uh, how I think of LSU. I think Georgia right now is just it's. It's the school president. It's the frat, the, 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 the president of the fraternity. It's the dude who makes all A's. It's the dude that can do nothing wrong. And I know last year was last year. Yeah, they lost in the SEC championship game. In other situations, it probably still would have made the college football playoff. Um, but the chips fell where they were, and Georgia didn't deserve a spot. Uh, but it, that doesn't take away from exactly, what it's become. Because it's, that's it's exactly still a dynasty. What I think of like, I, I, I know that, like, if we're talking the word dynasty, I always view the word dynasty as like, this is a group, a family of rulers. So you can't lose and still be ruling, but George is still kind of ruling college football right now. Mm -hmm. Yeah. George is a dynasty and LSU is, is I, I don't know that he's out or out. He's out of the game early, but he's definitely, the one that you're worried about is going to embarrass you tonight. He, but he, he could be a great <laughs> yes. time without a doubt, but he's going to get sloppy before this night's over. And Texas, um, I think you're right. First of all, Texas is set up. I mean, the, the talent on campus is, is getting incredible and getting, maybe not quite there, but getting to the level of Georgia. And I just think the quarterback handoff from Quinn Ewers to Arch Manning is going to set Texas up for a good four or five year run at the beginning uh, of joining the SC. By the way, I have like a thousand. I have a thousand dollar bet. I have a second bet. I can't remember, but I went, we went double or nothing this this off season. Um, that I have a thousand dollar bet that Texas will win the SEC within the first five years. I feel really With good who? about that bet. Uh, my brother in law, who is You're, Arkansas yeah, slash gonna Texas that. Tech, You're gonna win that. You're gonna win that. I'm gonna you win, might win that, that bet. Texas. Um, Texas was the dude that was um, snorting coke and saying, do you know who my dad is? But, you know, he got threatened that the trust fund's going to dry up. There will be nothing waiting for him. And he got his act together. And you're right. So now he, he's going to inherit the company and he's going to run the company. Um, A&M's weird because, like, A&M is Texas's cousin that probably comes from oil wealth as well. But that side of the family never left the farm, never left the ranch. And so they're still... Um, you know, kind of weird and definitely rednecky, and I love a definitely what weird. it's worth. I actually places a cult. Definitely weird, but help me understand who like A and M is that dude at, at the fraternity, you're, and you're like, um, I love that he hunts and fishes, but he's always he's doing something weird at the campfire at night. Like, why is he? He's gonna break out his guitar and sing again. Like, what is he doing? But it, distinguish A and M for me from mississippi state because i think of mississippi state also as like he's the redneck in the frat well texas a and is the try hard right texas a and m is like you said bringing a, a, a guitar around a campfire but really sucks at guitar right he's really trying hard to to meet the right girl at a bar but he doesn't have any game right like that's kind of where texas a and m is now sometimes things work out sometimes he stumbles across a great song and people are entertained sometimes he gets lucky, like whatever that is to me, Texas A&M is, is full of potential. Like from a football perspective, like it's one of the few programs and UCLA is in this and Arizona state's in this group where I just want to want to grab them and shake them and be like, why aren't you better than what you are? You could be so much better. And you know, they, they just, it, there's, it's almost like they, they, they try really hard to take steps that are, I guess, going to pay off in the immediate future or they think will but they never think long term and that's why they got in trouble with the Jimbo thing so they got in trouble with the Manzels like it's they they're always taking a small step in the wrong direction even when they're moving forward which is like like when they got Manzel in the SEC so 
Yeah, I mean, I, it's um, it's a difficult life if you're a Texas A&M fan because you're always so full of hope and you just get that rug pull all the time. And sometimes it's the fault of Texas A&M. A lot of times it is uh, the administrative side, but um, you know, it's 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 got to be frustrating for Mississippi State. I I redneck is not what I view written Mississippi State. I view Mississippi State as that drunk fun uncle that you're always going to have a good time with no matter what like you are good he's going to annoy everybody around you he's going to embarrass you sometimes but it's a fun kind of embarrassment right um because i love mississippi state fans i love mississippi state or starkville it is a great place it is so much fun to go there and yeah they want their football team to win but I, when it terms to when it comes to winning the party, both of those Mississippi schools do that better than anybody else in the SEC. But I, I didn't know that about Starkville. I didn't. So that's good for me to know. Um, you know who's a mystery to me? I want to do a few more schools. A mystery to me is Ole Miss because here's my perception of Ole Miss. It's like <laughs> hotty toddy, right? It's like Southern too proper like wearing the they wear they, they get dressed up right in like their sunday best uh, i think do they do that for games um but then i, think I, they do I that so all i the time, think of it for games yeah but i think of you know miss so I, I have a theory it's not a theory but you've got two types of schools in almost every state you've got You've got the flagship institution, which becomes a little bit like the T-SIPs, the Texas fan. That's from Dallas and Houston, all the proper places, all the right private schools or whatnot. And then you've got the land-grant college, right? And that's a little more down-to-earth, you know, small towners. And that's Oklahoma and Oklahoma State. That's what that is. That's Texas and Texas A&M. That's Auburn and Alabama. And that's Ole Miss and Mississippi State. Um, but I was also, like somebody said this recently to me, is that they said, Ole Miss is Texas Tech like easy to get into academically. So they were more talking about like not, not known as a great academic institution. So I'm having trouble reconciling who, who is Ole Miss. From a, from an academic standpoint. Yeah. Maybe you can say Texas tech. I think from a personality standpoint, I would think they're more SMU. If you're going to talk about um, schools that you're familiar with in the Texas area. Um, very prim, not prim and proper. Uh, preppy is the right way to go. I'm talking, yeah, they get the girls get dressed up in prom dresses for football games against Alcorn State, and they have, and that's great. It's awesome. If you haven't been to the Grove, go to the Grove. It's a can't miss uh, tailgating experience for sure. Uh, dudes in pastel button ups with white visors tilted a little bit to the side. You know, that's that's how they roll, and that's great. They own it. It's awesome. Um, so yeah, uh, when you're right about the state schools and they sort of have that air of superiority and they have that at Ole Miss. And to an extent, maybe they should at times uh, based on the football success or based on the academic academics, they compare it to Mississippi state and whatever. Um, but to me, the, the attitude of the fans is, is exactly like it is perceived nationwide, which is a good thing because that they own it and it is awesome. So um, from a, from a uh, comparing it to Texas tech from an academic perspective, I, okay. Yeah, maybe I could see that. I don't really know a whole lot about the academic situation at Ole Miss. I know I have some friends that went there and they are great dudes and they somehow made it through there without failing. i and because I don't know how that is. Yeah. Maybe that does make sense because I know for a fact, if I did what they did, I would not be graduating. Well, that's, I mean, I don't think Ole Miss and Texas Tech because Texas Tech is not preppy and not prim and proper. And for the record, I don't know that I've ever met a dude that went to Tech that I didn't like. Like, Tech dudes uh -huh. are awesome guys. Um, but uh, there's the two other schools that, that I wanted to ask about. One is Tennessee, and I lived outside of Knoxville for about five months during COVID. And I, and I, got, I grew very fond of, of, of the whole state of Tennessee. But I don't really know, like, the stereotype of Tennessee. It's kind of hard to peg because they have become so cynical, right? Um, about 10, 15 years ago, toward the – I guess it was more like 20 now because I guess we're old dudes now. But towards the end of the former years and the beginning of the Derek Doolander era, era like, it's one of those things where they, they thought they should win. They, shot, they thought they should run college football just like Texas A&M does. Right. Like they they really thought that. And then it just kept the, the, the 
follies just kept coming on and on on top of each other. And oh, I got kept it. Building and building and I building. Got it. Yeah. Good looking dude. Good looking dude that was killing it in the fraternity, but he started balding a little bit earlier than everybody else, and his confidence is shattered. Yes. Ate too much pizza, drank too much Bush Light. Yes. That's 100%. That's what Tennessee is. And now to me, <laughs> And I look, I love Tennessee fans and <laughs> Vol fans on Twitter. They call themselves Vol Twitter. They are the best at interneting. I mean, they are awesome. Um, they <laughs> right now, they it's like one of the that guy, that guy that went balding, you know, he drank too many bush lights. I'd say right now, Tennessee, he took Ozempic and now he's starting to look <laughs> a little slimmer. Now he's starting to feel it a little bit. He, he maybe got some hair plugs and he's looking pretty good. And, you know, walks into the divorcee bar at age 48, 49, 50, and is like, dang, I'm, I'm, a, I'm a 10 among these people. So I'm back, I baby. Think that's, I'm back. Yeah. And, it, and look, Tennessee <laughs> is back to an extent. When was the last time Tennessee was relevant in football? Like, it's, it, it's been T. Martin literally since 2007. And now they're pretty darn good. And it might get better yeah. because Josh Eibel's a good coach. Um, okay, last one. This kind of ties into um, – it's part SEC, part ACC, and it ties into that two types of schools. You know which kind of – which one – I don't know that it defies my my breakdown of state by state, but – and and I, I'm getting a little inside knowledge because my nephew plays football, uh, offensive line for Clemson. And Clemson, South Carolina is interesting because it's the opposite. You would think Clemson is the sort of like – prestige institution in South Carolina is the is the public school that you know is default for too many people but it's the opposite like South Carolina is the one where you know I don't know all, all the kids from Columbia or wherever it is uh maybe even Charleston you know want to go and be part of society and Clemson yes. was the ag school the engineering school they were Auburn they they're they're A&M but because they sound like a private school Clemson and <laughs> because they're not good at football it's seen like it's seen externally outside of South Carolina as the opposite of what it actually is you know what you mentioned Clemson and Auburn and i i found this, i went to Auburn and i'm almost positive the same uh, architect design the both campuses from a landscape and I think from so. architectural standpoint. And they call it Auburn with a lake. Um, and you, and the, my, my comparison to Clemson is you're exactly right. They're the exact same school. The only difference is that when Auburn was good, when Auburn has been good, Alabama has as well. Clemson doesn't have to deal with that with South Carolina. Because if, if Alabama wasn't there, Auburn would have won multiple national championships just like Clemson did. It's the exact same thing, just in a little bit of a different location that makes it a lot easier to become notable if you're Clemson. Um, and that's great. Like they, They've taken advantage of that, and, and I love Dabo Sweeney. He's done, um, done things there that they've craved for so long, exactly like what was the case at Auburn before Cam Newton got there. So, yeah, I mean, I think that the comparison between the two is completely accurate. I think the one difference in that state is that South Carolina University of South Carolina is nowhere close to what Alabama is. So Clemson, it's a lot easier for them to sort of become that most, the most notable program, not in that state, but really in the ACC and really along the Atlantic coast at that point. You know, I'm a big fan of Shane Beamer, big fan. And I think he has South Carolina headed in, in a good direction. Um, it's South. I, I am fascinated by, and I've thought about this as well, the, the schools you'd like to shake uh, uh, and say you should be better. You said A&M, you said UCLA. I don't know. Do you think South Carolina is that? Like, or is there a ceiling on what Shane Beamer can do at South Carolina? I, who, how, and look, we don't have to get caught up too much in South Carolina. Like, what are the other schools that you're like, wow, that's a brand, that's a recruiting base. That is a state where you, you could and should be better than what you've produced at UCLA. Yeah, I mean, I think with, with South Carolina, it's, they were so bad for so long. I mean, I'm talking like a century, literally more than a century. They were horrible, and the fan base never wavered, got bigger. And to me, that support says something. And when they got good with, with Steven Garcia and then Clowney and, and Lattimore and all those guys, then, yeah, they saw, hey, we could be a top five team. But they just haven't been able to, to repeat it. They've sort of been one or two steps behind everybody else. So now in this new look SEC and what will eventually become the AFC, NFC of, of college football, which is you know kind of where we're headed, South Carolina, I think, missed its window a little bit because th those late Spurrier years, like I think when Spurrier retired, that was like the worst possible thing for that program because 
he could have groomed the next coach and he didn't. And then everything fell apart. And I think the ceiling for South Carolina, to me anyway, will be moving forward. Hey, flirtation with the 12 or 14 team playoff in a couple of years. And mostly just an eight or nine win team at best. And a lot of times six and six. And I think for South Carolina, you have to kind of take a step back for the fan base and you're you're the administration and say, okay, is that acceptable? Because based on the, the history of the program in its entirety, that's great. That's awesome. That's exactly where you want to be. Uh, but in this day and age of instant gratification and with what they were able to do when Clowney was there, I mean, it, it might not be enough. I love Shane Beamer. I think he's a tremendous coach. I think he's a tremendous man. I think he's, he's tried his best to make yes. South Carolina marketable, and he's done a pretty good job of it. It's just so – it's going to be so hard moving forward to, to find an identity in the new world of college football. But who, who else? So UCLA, A&M, like if you shook – uh, somebody in the shoulders said you should be better. Is there, is there anybody else that kind of satisfies that? I'm thinking outside of the SEC. I'm, uh, I mean, Penn State is is good, but they they seem Penn to cap State's out at like you know top. Yeah, we they don't go for the, over the hump from top ten to legitimate top four type team. Yeah, I mean, I think North Carolina's one because they have really? resources. Yeah, I think North Carolina should be a lot. Like when Mac was there the first time, they were phenomenal. And, and like they were in the mix for national championships. That's why he got the job at Texas. I think the, but what the about money the whole, that is there. The whole basketball football thing. No one can be good at both at the same time. That, I mean, Alabama. Just really quickly. <laughs> yeah, but it's not a basketball school. You know, and they're doing, they're doing, a, I mean, they're like Texas, con, I, honestly. Like their, their basketball program is fairly comparable to Texas. Like, all right, a sweet 16 run, maybe an elite eight run. But not not in that top tier of college basketball. Ohio State's flirted at times with that as well. Um, yes. Michigan, Michigan might be historically at least the best at at being tops in both of those. North Carolina's a basketball school. Yeah, Michigan State's I think one too. Like when we're talking about you know land grant school and and state school, Michigan State's one of those where there's really no reason why it can't be a really competitive little brother that throws some haymakers every once in a while and knocks big brother out like that, that to me should that they should yeah. be able to do that. There's been obviously issues with the head coach with Mel Tucker. That's been a little bit of a problem. You know, the Antonio retired, he was phenomenal uh, before Mel got there. They made a bad investment and now they're sort of an afterthought. I think they, they should be able to land a few haymakers every once in a while beyond what they were in 15 when they made the playoff, because that was, you know, they, they had, they had a couple of good quarterbacks, you know, back to back and, and, and got the job done. That's it. So I think Michigan state, Penn state's one that absolutely uh, fits that mold. And like I said, the Arizona schools, Arizona state specifically being in, in Metro Phoenix, having all that Phoenix and the Arizona, the state, the state of the talent that's there, they can dip into Utah, which has got some great offensive line talent, almost exclusive, almost all the time, Southern California, they can dip in, get some of those players out of the San Diego area. So Arizona State's one that I look at, and especially in the Big 12 now, where you know there's really not a a power. Like, is it going to be Oklahoma State? Is it going to be you know Utah? Is it going to be Arizona State? Why wouldn't it be Arizona State? Why couldn't it be Arizona State at this point? Right. Yeah, Arizona's a basketball school, so that's their problem. That's we, and we should we should point out. Um, I, I would be remiss if I didn't say. Yeah, we talked about Alabama and Texas, Tennessee's probably if you ranked them for the year 2023, 24. Tennessee, are they the best combo football basketball school right now? Like they're pretty no, good at both. I don't know who's doing. Bama made the playoff and they're in the Sweet 16, so I think it had to be Bama. Two seed in Tennessee. Okay, all right, we'll give it to Bama right now. Because I mean, ten- um, like Tennessee this year was was good, but I mean, Tennessee was not that great. But like they were not great by you know normal football standards. Great by Tennessee standards, but you know. Nine and three, not really in the, the division championship hunt. I think that's that's enough to sort of set them back just a little bit. All right. I wanna I wanna save a minute for uh uh NFL rules with you for just a second, but one last um question on this on this college thing. Um you mentioned uh AFC NFC. So you're talking about SEC Big Ten. Um eventually we have this super conference. So what happens to like 
so Florida State and Clemson, they go to one of those. North Carolina, I don't know what happens with North Carolina. You, you, I mean, and what, the Big 12 ends up just, a, I don't know, a minor league? I mean, it's going to be a good basketball conference, I guess. I don't know. Yes, so yes, so you think is. the SEC and Big 10 are going to eat up some more teams? What's going to happen? Yeah, I mean, I think they will at some point. The, the contracts for these teams, like they've purposely made them smaller. Right. All the networks have made these like the the Fox deal with the Big 12, I think, ends in 31, which that was signed last year. (laughs) We never have something like that. Usually it's much longer than that. So um, I think, yes, you're going to get to that point, but there's still going to be stragglers left over and but that are that are still competitive. That still can sort of jump in. You're not going to they're not going to separate completely. You're going to have this sort of jumbled mess below the SEC and Big Ten. FSU and, and Clemson are definitely knocking on the SEC's door. I don't know if they're going to answer. And I said this on my show this week. If you're an SEC team, does Florida State and or Clemson or both together give you $75 million in value? Because if they don't, then you're going to have to take a pay cut to have them in your conference. Is it worth it? Well, I don't know. Maybe. Do you think as part of this, real quick, Bear, as part of the shakeup, do you think anybody gets booted? Like, we just went through our frat brother thing for the SEC, and apologies to Arkansas, Missouri, and Florida. And no, no one's thinking Florida's at risk of getting dropped. But, like, Vanderbilt's the nerd, for the record, um, who doesn't go to the parties. <laughs> you got to boost the fraternity's GPA. For, That's what they're there for. <laughs> he does boost the GPA. But, like, do you think Vanderbilt and Missouri or – even Mississippi State are at threat of not being a part of the future SEC. No, nah, they'll 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 be around. I mean, the SEC, especially with the the founding members, they're not going to kick anybody out. And the Big Ten, they value academics, so the ones that are nerds, so to speak, are are going to stick around. Um, I, I'm still kind of on the fence as to what happens. I do think you're going to develop an AFC NFC thing, but you're you're also going to have that sort of be you know, presenting a shadow to the rest that teams can get out of. You know, I think in the Big 12, what, and I've said this this week, Florida State and Clemson could go to the Big 12 when that contract comes up, the media rights contract comes up in 2031, because they're going to have five years of lawyers collecting billable hours anyway. So it, it, it times up kind of well. Um, this idea that the Big 10 and the SEC are going to separate, to me, that was a threat to get what they wanted, which is more money, which is driving everything these days and they got it with the college football playoff revenue distribution being weighted more towards those two conferences so i don't think that we will have a pure sort of super conference or super conferences that only sort of worry about each other Um, it will stay dysfunctional because there's still value in non-power two teams non-power two programs um and and i always i always talk about college athletics this way um, it's not clean. It's not proper. It's not symmetric. It's not supposed to be. It's it's a beautiful right. beautiful disaster. You know that's that's okay. Always has been. It's it's dysfunctional for a reason. And for me, that's a feature. That's not a bug. I love the fact oh, like that, that it's beautifully dysfunctional. Oh, I like that. Yeah, you're right. I mean, that's the history of college football. We used to vote on a national champion. This was never clean. Yeah, um, it was never it's just. Fine. Um, all right, I want to ask you about you cover everything over at Outkick and on, on uh, the Smothered and Covered podcast as well. But I want to ask you about um, NFL real quick, and just when it comes to, to rules. So, two two rules the NFL adopted this week. One was they got rid of the hip drop tackle, which everybody talked about all season long and was injuring guys, and and they're going to reform uh, kickoffs. Uh, let's do kickoffs first. Um, so this this seems good. I mean, the kicker's going to be lined yeah. up. It looked like a good what. 20 yards behind the line um and the two lines are on like the the receiving ends 40 roughly i think it is yes uh the kicker's on his own 35 or so on 40 and um you know everybody's saying this is going to make i saw eric galco who who worked at the xfl like eric smart guy helped develop this for the xfl he goes it's just going to make kickoffs look more like a running play and it'll change the kind of guys you put back there so it'll be less speedsters guys that can fly It'll be more guys that know how to pick a hole like a running back. Um, and it'll be safer. Um, so I think this is good. I am a little concerned that we're headed toward I say I'm concerned because my son is a high school kicker and punter. Uh that we're headed towards the Larry David path. You know, Larry David said on the Rich Eisen show he just wants to do away with kickers, get them out of the game. Right. Um, and he makes a funny and compelling argument. It's like 
game on the line. Let's pull this guy over here. Don't even practice with everybody over here to decide the game. And I get it, even though my kid's a kicker. But it, this seems good. Um, this seems good, this new rule for kicking. Yeah, I'm fine with it. You know, the XFL did basically the same thing last year. And and look, I mean, I, I know traditional to say, well, it's a contact sport. You know, you're, 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 you're taking things away from it or whatever. But I mean, honestly, kickoffs are very dangerous. <laughs> you know, they, they, when you have, you know, a group of people running full speed from 20 yards away from each other and pounding each other in the head, you're going to have injuries. That's not if that that can be avoidable. And so they're making it avoidable. And I was fine with it watching in the XFL. I thought it was a it still kept a lot of the strategy in to to what is normally a, a, a pretty boring event because kickoffs now I mean, what I don't even know the number probably 75 80% end up in touchbacks anyway. So yeah, if you're yeah, not kickers gonna have, have legs worth that- yeah, or if you're going to actually have returns, at least make them safe, at least make them look more like football plays, and it's exactly what it's doing. So I'm fine with it. Um, the, the surprise onside kick not being available anymore kind of sucks because I love those. Um, but, you mm-hmm. know, beyond that, you know, traditionalists will say they don't like it. You're, it's going to take a week or two, and then no one's going to think about it ever again. It'll be like the pitch clock in baseball. Like, do, you, do you even think about it anymore? No, and it's only been around for a year. I love it. Um. Are you with Larry David? Would you get rid of kickers? No, kickers are people too. I love kickers. <laughs> kickers are like the, the kickers to me are like the weird reliever out of the bullpen. Like you don't really know what they're thinking because they're never thinking normally, but they're always entertaining and important. Let me tell you something that stinks being a kicker's dad. There's no upside. I mean, there's one scenario <laughs> clearly that's, that's an upside. That's the game winning kick, but um, I'm going to be honest. I don't those, think it's really worth good. it. That's right. Like, it's not worth it because if you don't make it, you hear your fellow parents. And it's your problem. It's just bad parenting if they don't make it. <laughs> All right. Hip drop tackle. Don't like this. All right. For me. And here's why. I just don't like gray legislation. I don't like, I don't like how holding is impossible to tell and inconsistent. I don't like basketball officiating. I don't, I don't like um, pass interference because I don't like whether or not something's a catch. I just think that this is an example of places where we over-legislate but underdefine and then can't define, neither in the replay, replay booth or on the field, something that's happening in real time. And it's also like hitting the quarterback. Like I don't know what these defenders are supposed to do. Now, I've actually had some guys on play defense said, no, you can who was it? Brandon Seiler, I think. It was like, no, you can. You, you can pull up. You can figure it out. I don't know if that's true or not. But this hip drop tackle, I mean, there's going to be all kinds of debate about, like, are you behind the guy? Are you, you know, on his side? I, I, just, it's, it, I think it's a recipe for a mess. It's, it's going to be a mess. Yeah, it's like targeting in college football. No one can define it. And when you see it, it might be targeting. It might not be. Who knows? Um, to me... I'm a hundred percent in agreement with you. It's not, it's going to be loosely defined and no one's going to be able to define it. And it's going to vary based on official to official and game to game. And I I think the egregious ones should absolutely be flagged. Like when you, when you suplex a dude, okay. I mean, it's not WWE. Um, Those guys practice how to do that without getting hurt. Football players don't. Um, So if it's something like that, I agree, but it's going to bleed into normal everyday tackles, right? You're going to have a guy running a sweep and, you know, it's just going to be sort of an accidental, you know, hip drop tackle and you're going to get flagged 15 yards. It's like an accidental face mask or a a face mask that costs 15 yards. I mean, you weren't doing it intentionally. You just had to get the dude down and it just sort of happened. And I don't like that stuff, Um, you know, to me and getting back to the face mask thing. I loved it when there was the five and the 15. The five yard face mask and the fifteen yard face mask. Totally cool with that. Yeah. Um, and if if you want to get this out of the game, do something like that because it is it is obvious if someone suplexes a dude that yeah that's a penalty. There's no doubt about that. If you just sort of do it on accident, which is going to happen a lot because you know there are bodies flying at you know a million miles an hour at each other, it shouldn't be something that is you know just it, that is worth the 15 yard pen- penalty that just doesn't make sense to me and with that five and 15 is good i think you can see some level of egregiousness or intentionality uh you certainly can when yeah. it comes to face masks well uh, and when in targeting too like when in targeting for for college football if a dude goes head hunting 
yeah, kick him out of the game. Like 100% kick him out of the game. If it's just like a, a situation where, hey, I'm going in for a tackle and I'm going to tackle you, Will, and you kind of duck your head a little bit bracing for it and I accidentally go helmet to helmet with you when I'm not meaning to, sorry. Like, <laughs> what, what do you want me to do, you know? Right, right. Smothered and covered. Check it out. He'll keep you covered on college football and the sports world. And he's new columnist at Outkick. It's Barrett Sally. Man, this has been fun. Thanks for being on the Will Kane Show. Thanks, Will. Appreciate it. There you go. I hope you enjoyed that conversation with Barrett Sally. Again, check him out at Outkick. Next, what's going on with Dak? What's going on in Dallas? That's coming up on the Will Kane Show. Something is happening in Dallas. What's happening with Dak? It's the Will Kane Show. Kane on Sports Edition every Friday, exclusively focused on the world of sports. You can get this by subscribing on YouTube or in podcast at Apple or on Spotify. Just go hit subscribe. It's a big time in sports in Dallas. It's good to be a fan in Dallas. The stars, number one. Almost every projection for postseason success suggests the Dallas Stars are legitimate contenders for the Stanley Cup. Short up defense, incredible offense, rookies contributing. I'm excited about hockey playoff time in the NHL. The Dallas Mavericks are on a run. They've won nine of their last 10 games. They've climbed up to number, I think it is six in the Western Conference playoff seedings. Um, and they want to avoid the play-in tournament. And Kyrie and Luka are gelling. And the big men, Daniel Gafford and Derek Lively, look like studs. Good, hopeful time for the Dallas Mavericks. Texas Rangers are your World Series champion. But what's happening with the Dallas Cowboys? The Dallas Cowboys have been completely absent from NFL free agency. They've done nothing, really, to make their team better this offseason. And what more, they're doing nothing about locking up their quarterback, Dak Prescott, for the future. He's scheduled to be an unrestricted free agent at the end of next season. Now is the time when you would think Jerry and Stephen Jones would work out an extension for Dak Prescott. Why? Because you'd lock up your quarterback for another five years, but you'd also alleviate your salary cap by stretching his salary and giving you some room to sign free agents. Like Extending quarterbacks is about creating, in the short term, in the immediate term, Salary cap space. And the Cowboys seem uninterested in creating salary cap space because they seem uninterested in extending Dak Prescott. So what are they going to do? Are they going to walk into this year letting him play out his contract? Are they just doing it for media attention? I wouldn't put it beyond Jerry Jones to do it when it has maximum impact. But something weird is happening in Dallas. And when I say weird, really unprecedented. The only parallel at all is Kirk Cousins, one of the few quarterbacks who is a starting franchise-level quarterback, you know, if not a Super Bowl-level quarterback, a franchise-starting quarterback, to ever hit unrestricted free agency. When then the Redskins, now commanders, let him go to the Minnesota Vikings, Kirk Cousins raked it in. He made a ton of money. And he has again now with the Atlanta Falcons. But we rarely see a quarterback, even at Cousins' level, make their way into free agency. Are the Cowboys going to allow this to happen with Dak Prescott? Let's be clear for a second about Dak. It's health. It's fine. You have doubts about Dak. I have my ups and downs with Dak. But here are some objective truths. Dak is a top 10 quarterback in the NFL. Dak has at times been an MVP candidate in the NFL. Almost every statistical measure places him well above the top 10, places him in the top five for his career, and on a season-by-season basis. I'm talking about not just touchdowns to interceptions, which that's important, not just yardage, but advanced metrics, like like um, expected completion percentage, like air yards downfield, like accuracy on the deep ball. Dak is great. He is a definite top 10, debatable top five, probably number seven quarterback in the NFL. And you don't see a quarterback like that hit unrestricted free agency. On the other hand, he doesn't have success in the playoffs. And I think it's fair. I think it's rational to ask the question whether or not he can ever get you over the hump. I think that's okay. 
But you have to balance that sort of abstraction, that emotional, that opinion, that subjective gut against the objective evidence that I'm just laying out for you on who he is. If Dak reaches free agency, be clear about something. He will break the bank. He will have, I don't know how many teams looking to pay him top, top dollar. It only takes one, really two, to create a bidding war. But Dak will have four or five. And they will be teams that face him twice a year that know who he is. The Commanders, the Giants. That's who Adam Schefter suggested would be all-in suitors for Dak Prescott. And, and others. Because it's so hard to find one. The quarterback wilderness is the weirdest and worst and most desolate place in sports landscape. And I can't imagine a franchise willingly walking away from, say, the seventh or eighth best quarterback in the NFL into the quarterback wilderness. That's not what the commanders did when they decided Cousins wasn't top tier. I mean, you can't come up with an example of somebody letting a quarterback at that level walk to willingly go into the wilderness. Now, I, there's no way the Cowboys think that Trey Lance, what was he, the former number three overall pick in the draft that they got for a fourth-round draft pick from the San Francisco 49ers, is ready to take over and be the future of the franchise. There's no way. You can hope, but you can't expect or plan for that to be the case. And if they are going to let Dak walk, you would think they'd start this year and drafting his replacement. But who would that be? They picked 24th. I mean, that's going to be like Michael Penix, perhaps, from Washington. And he can't, why would Michael Penix be better in any way than Dak Prescott, except for that he's cheaper? And that's not an, I don't mean to wave my hand at somebody being cheaper because then you can bolster the rest of your lineup. But you know what? Cowboys haven't yet locked up C.D. Lamb. they got to figure out what they're going to do with Micah Parsons. Jory Epstein, who's an NFL reporter for Yahoo, suggested C.D. Lamb won't sign until Justin Jefferson does. And Justin Jefferson sets the market for receivers, and then C.D. wants to get his money. And she also quoted rival executives in the NFL saying, be careful with Micah. This was Epstein talking. She said, Micah shows up big in moments and games that don't matter. But when it comes to the plays and the games that do matter, where's Micah? So do you pay him? Do you break the bank? For me, that answer is obvious. Yes. Micah Parsons is franchise. And yeah, I want to build my franchise around Micah Parsons. I want to keep C.D. Lamb. But I can't imagine walking into the wilderness. Something is happening in Dallas. Now, part of it's tied to the fact that head coach Mike McCarthy kind of seems to be a dead man walking, like one and done. I don't know what he would have to do to save his job weirdly after three 12 and five seasons, but at a minimum, it would be make the NFC championship game. Otherwise, I think that the Cowboys find a new coach next year. I just, I'm not telling you would, should, could. I'm telling you what I think will be. I think they'll have a new coach if they don't at a minimum make the NFC championship game. And if you have a new coach and you say, does the new coach want to have $60 million, $55 million wrapped up in Dak Prescott, a top, seven, eight quarterback in the NFL with questions about whether or not he can take you to the promised land. I don't know what's happening in Dallas, but I do get the sense something weird right now is happening with the Dallas Cowboys. And unfortunately, what's happening for the Cowboys is not the same thing that's happening for the Rangers, the Mavericks, and the Stars. That's going to do it for me today here on the Will Kane Show. Kane on Sports, sports exclusive. Download, hit subscribe, YouTube. Apple or Spotify. Follow me on Instagram, C. Will Kane, or on X at Will Kane. You can get clips and updates on the Will Kane Show. I will see you again next time.